I want to thank you for joining me tonight. I'm counting down the final episodes uh, of this program here on Fox News. I think most people are aware, but in case you aren't, we have 14 shows left here on Fox. 14. And I'm not taking that lightly. Um, it's strange as I enter a new phase in my life to close this one up and what is it that I want to say to you after I think 27 months here and a couple of years over at the other network things are changing and that's why I'm that's why I'm moving into a different phase I spent most of the weekend trying to figure out what is the most important thing I could say to you in the next 14 episodes what are the things that I, I need to tell you before you and I um, don't meet here every day. I keep coming back to the thing that I'm asked most often. Glenn, we got it. We understand the problem. We got it. What do we do? We know the Constitution is under attack. I think people are starting to wake up now that the Western way of life is hanging by a thread. This is so much bigger than Barack Obama. We know that we are losing our freedoms bit by bit and not just in this country. Look at Greece. They're losing it because they've overspent. So what do we do? That's the question. What do we do? Because calling on Congress really doesn't cut it anymore, really. Making signs doesn't seem like it's good enough. Um, we have to be self-reliant, really. Self-reliant. We have to be the Americans that the world has always counted on when there was trouble. We have to be the ones that solve the problems and think outside of the box not the ones that stand and wait for the government. In a second, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures, and they're the pictures that I hope that will stick with you today. The first one is of a house in Alabama, and this isn't the only house that, has, that is in this uh, particular situation. This family um, just received a letter from FEMA, and in the letter it said that their house was livable, that a FEMA inspector came by, looked at their house, and said, sure, it has some problems, but it's still livable and safe for them to live in. Therefore, they are uneligible for any aid or shelter from FEMA. I want to show you now the picture of the family in the house that FEMA says is okay. Here it is. You gotta be kidding me, right? Look at that. I mean, well, they do, it seems like they do kind of have that what may have been a deck at one point. It's still there, they can live on the deck. FEMA says this house is safe to live in. The problem is, there is no house. And again, this isn't the only family in this situation. Several other letters, just like that one, have been received in the same community. Now, what do you do? Well, we can whine about it, or we can start to revive the America that I don't think has been alive since the progressive movement began. The one that would see a handout or a FEMA truck and say, turn your damn truck around. We got it. Thanks, but no thanks. Now, this is going to be increasingly hard to do because we pay taxes, and our taxes are going to go up because we have spent too much. When you need help, you expect your tax dollars back. It's paying for insurance, but that insurance never pays out. If the federal government, to be honest with you, was a private company, they all would have been in jail a long time ago. But we don't put them in jail because they're the jail keepers. This is why George Washington told us never give government this much power. But we have. So, what do we do? Well, we have to recognize and speak the truth plainly. It's important to know that there are people in and out of this government all around the world and here inside our own country that are working to transform us into something we have never been. Some people believe it's uh, for our own good. Others are just motivated by greed. Which brings me to the second picture. This was created in the early 20th century. It was uh, created by the progressives over in England. It is the famous Fabian Socialist Window. And it's important that you understand this. These are revolutionaries that are stoking the flames to heat the world up to then remold it nearer to the heart's desire. Now, 
These men are kneeling down to man's knowledge. Below, the ten members of the society that are kneeling with their hands in prayer towards a stack of books. The books uh, signify, can you bring up the books? Uh, we have uh, plays from uh, George Bernard Shaw. We have, uh, oh, the history of trade unionism. We have a new world for old. It's fantastic. There is no doubt in my mind that this is exactly what is happening today. Revolutionaries are molding our world closer to their heart's desire. Not rogue, insignificant revolutionaries, but some in very high positions of power. Even in our own White House, as this program in the last 27 months has shown you. The next 14 days, we will show you what they're doing now and how close we are to the edge. They're doing it through the economy. They're heating the world through the devaluation of the dollar, jobs, energy, and now through Israel and extremist Islam. Almost all of these things tie in to that Fabian socialist window, and the trip wires have been laid. I want to show you what we're facing here. We have the debt ceiling, we have QE2, which is money printing, and we have the new Israel ultimatum, which President Obama has uh, just put together. Let's look at these one by one. The debt ceiling, we've already pushed it uh, aside once already, but what are the possible uh, outcomes of the debt ceiling? Well, A, we raise the debt ceiling, and when we do that, we go broke because we don't have any more money. We just continue to print and borrow more money, if we're lucky, that we don't have. Or B, we don't raise the debt ceiling. What happens? Well, you do that and the economy dives into a tailspin just as well because we cannot meet or pay for the obligations we have made. We default. So either way, this is a lose-lose situation. Are there any other sources of income? I mean, is China going to forgive our debt? Is Timothy Geithner going to suddenly, you know, remember that he has $20 trillion under his mattress? The next one is QE2. This one's happening this summer. It's ending. That's a fancy term, in case you don't know, for printing money that we don't have and then throwing it at the economy in hopes of some miraculous recovery that is not going to happen. It never works that way. It only artificially props up the economy. So there will be calls for QE3. You're beginning to see those seeds being planted right now. And so the choices on this one is we don't print the money and we suffer an economic pain because the false prop is removed. But people in America are not ready for it. No one has prepared them. So we would have civil unrest. Or we could do QE3 and print more money, which would inflate our money, which would make things more expensive for you to buy and would lead to civil unrest. And then the Israel ultimatum. This one happens by September. This weekend, the Obama administration gave Israel 30 days to comply with the 1967 border rules. According to their National Security Council, quote, we have a month to see if we can work something out with the Israelis and the Palestinians as accepting these principles as a basis for negotiations. Well, now there's a reasonable timeline on solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a conflict that has gone on for decades and centuries. Guys! You got 30 days. Why didn't I think of that earlier? This presidency thing is a breeze for Barack Obama. If Israel plays along and tries to negotiate swaps and goes back to the life-threatening 1967 borders, it will lead to the destruction of Israel and the Western way of life. However, if they don't do that, well, then opponents of Israel Remember, they don't want just the voting rights. They want Israel swept into the sea. The U.S. will have to back off on supporting Israel as the world gathers at the U.N. and all points the finger to the evil Israel. I have to tell you, I have um, looked at this problem now for five years and brought it to you every night on the, uh, on the air. I have looked for an escape hatch. Five years ago, I was talking about there are exits here, but we're passing them all. Please get off an exit. 
This is such a well-played hand. It is elegant in its, in its evil. Those who seek, up, to seek to heat up the globe as to remold it. And they've upped the ante again with the Israel ultimatum. More on that in a few minutes. So, that's where we're heading. But here's what you really need to know. Here's what you need to be aware of tonight. I believe a trap has been laid for you for our freedom and our Constitution. The elites of the world are all preparing. The George Soroses of the world, the World Bank, all the big governments, everyone. They're all doing it. What do you think all these meetings are for? What do you think they're talking about this weekend over in Europe? Please. They all know it's coming. It's unsustainable. You, however, are the only one that is made fun of or made to look stupid for preparing for a different world with a new set of rules and economic trouble. At first, for 27 months of this show, people said that what I was telling you every night wasn't true or wouldn't come to pass. Well, it was true and it has come to pass. And we have a very clear record for anyone who wants to look. So, if, it's, if it was true, what should you do? What is it? Well, others are preparing. You should prepare for tough times. You should prepare to help others. And you should prepare to explain and teach the truth. Others are being left alone when they're made fun of. In fact, the media is not even pointing out. A new report claims farmers in Africa are being driven off their lands. Nearly 150 million acres in Africa, about the size of France, has been gobbled up since the financial crash in 2009. Others have prepared. Now, who would want to grab that much farmland? Quote, vast new industrial farming projects backed by European hedge funds seeking profits and foreign countries looking for cheap food, end quote. Land can be purchased in war-torn places, you see, like Sierra Leone, for incredibly cheap prices, about 80 cents an acre. As everything begins to crumble, someone sees the value in cheap food sources in the future. Now I wonder which hedge fund geniuses could be behind something like that. So you know their investments are paying off anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. And the rich get richer. I want you to know I don't begrudge capitalists. I'm a capitalist. I believe the free market and capitalism saves more people than it has ever hurt. But I do, I do mind that some capitalists like George Soros will use their influence to destroy anyone who says to you, prepare and then buys up farmland. So he's prepared. Soros currently has plans to invest in agriculture and fisheries in Sierra Leone. How about that? He's investing in cocoa and rice and banana production, establishing rice mills. So obviously the money, the money people like George Soros, they are betting on rising food prices. Hmm. But he's not alone. He's not the only one doing it. American universities are also getting into the act. Yes, universities. You know, the ones that have raised their prices about 400% over the last decade or so. Vanderbilt and Harvard are just two who, through hedge funds, are taking part in the land grabs. Now, that's what the smart money is doing. What are you doing? What is our government doing? Are they preparing you or are they preparing themselves? What is the media doing? Are they warning you? Are they sounding the alarm? Or are they just lost on another story, another sea of unfortunate wiener picks? The experts told us, remember, last year, and we reported on it, that we needed a perfect growing season to avoid food shortages and higher prices. Since then, it's been nothing but fires, floods, tornadoes, droughts, the E. coli outbreak, and so much more. So much for the perfect season. So piece this together with me for just a second. Just last week, James Carville, in an interview, said that civil unrest is imminently possible. I believe that to be true. 
All signs verify this. The entire world is moving in the direction of civil unrest. And even in our country, although people will not tie these things together, our civil society is beginning to break down. That's what's kept us safe. We see it now in Denny's fights over syrup or somebody talking to their man. Yet anyone encouraging you to get reconnected with your house of worship, the American institutions that always solve these problems, is silenced or mocked yet again. So you don't prepare. Yet the FBI does. Eric Holder's Justice Department has just expanded powers again by giving significant new powers to its agents, letting them now search databases, quote, go through household trash, or use surveillance teams to scrutinize the lives of people who have attracted their attention. Where are all the wireless, warrantless wiretap furies? Um, where are they now? Where are the people? Where are the, where's the press this time around? By the way, the UN is also working on a small arms treaty, which purports to be a handy tool to fight terrorism. But if implemented, Second Amendment proponents, like me, believe that it will only enforce rougher licensing requirements, create more red tape, and possibly an international gun registry. As if terrorists give a flying crap about registering their gun or their machete before they kill you. This will be, do nothing but make it harder for you to get a gun. Why would you get a gun? To prepare for tough times. That's why. Cass Sunstein in the HuffPo today, they say he hasn't done enough. Cass Sunstein and Obama, I think, had to have celebrated this weekend. His regulation has now led to the closing of at least five coal plants here in America. American Electric Power said rather than spend billions to comply with EPA regulations, it'll just shut the plants down. That's mission accomplished for Obama, because remember, under his energy plan, energy prices will necessarily skyrocket, end quote. He just said today he's banking on clean energy. Well, I hope that bet comes through, and I guarantee you, clean energy, all the kind we have, will keep you warm in the summer and cool in the winter. Then we have war number four. It's still raging in Yemen. Is anybody covering the senseless war? No, that's 2008-ish, you know, passe. And to top it off, an avowed communist, Van Jones, I read this weekend, is kicking off the American Dream Movement. Here's a man who's never renounced his communist views. He's a communist, radical, revolutionary that has openly advocated for the overthrow of the United States. He hasn't changed his point of view, he's changed tactics. He's changed suits and take on, taken off his turtleneck. He's going to send millions of Americans into modern-day slavery under the camouflage of the American dream. It's sickening, and I bet progressives like Van Jones get twisted pleasure out of using the American dream, something they openly are hostile to, something that they believe cause all the problems of greedy capitalism, and use it as a stepping stone to form a government that treats people as cattle, but for the cattle's own good. The American dream, I'll have you know, is not under attack. The American dream, as you understand it, has gasped its last breath if we don't wake up soon. But the American dream isn't what you think it is. It is actually that phrase originally coined by a 20th century progressive, a Woodrow Wilson fan. The American dream, as Van Jones understands it, and this White House understands it, is about money your pension, your house, your job. This is the American dream Van Jones is fighting for, and it is not as old as our Constitution. Evidence, listen to the recent words of Van Jones himself. It's a threat, not just to Democrats or to the president, but to what we hold dear, what we have built up as a nation over a hundred years of progress toward the beauty of our founding dream. Mm. I think he caught himself there. The country was founded over 200 years ago. They're fighting for a different American dream. And you must know the difference. How would you define the American dream? 
It's not about your pension. It's not about your house or your job. I believe the American dream is simply that a man can make his own way, free of the entanglements of a king or a group of elites that treat a population like a group of toddlers getting dressed in the morning. Here, wear this. Your choice is this one or this one. We are being now told what we can and cannot eat, what we can and cannot drive, what we can and cannot say, what light bulbs to use, how we worship in the case of the circumcision fight in San Francisco. It's not America. America, we and the Western world are at a tipping point. And the only way to tip the scales towards preserving freedom is through the individual. And we must prepare as individuals, not to be self-sufficient alone, but prepare so you can help others, so the government doesn't have to. Remember, remember who you are, what God has done for you, what God has done for this country and man. Do not confine that to the walls of your house. Share those beliefs, share those blessings, and prepare to be a blessing to other as you lead the way out. Now, I don't know if you remember the peace-loving Egyptian cleric, we have no problems over there, who said that Muslims' financial problems all stem from the fact that they abandoned jihad. And the solution, I'm not kidding you, was to go on raids and bring back prisoners like women and children from here in America who could be sold on the open market quoting like groceries, end quote. Well, that obviously, you know, that was reported by, well, this show. And so now he's issued a response and saying, believe it or not, he was taken out of context. <laughs> I knew, I knew there had to be a perfectly logical explanation for all of this because he claims he was talking about the meaning of offensive jihad. And he went on to say that the taking of spoils of war, namely slaves, and sex slaves and children are all legitimate under Islam. Watch. Glad he cleared that one up. Because I was beginning to think maybe evil was on the rise over in the Middle East and we might be on the wrong side. No. But things are looking up because there's a new summer camp right there in the Middle East. Reach the youth, get them educated. <laughs> There's not a problem over there. We can trust these people. I've heard it from our CIA and our president. Now, what's the best way to stop, stop the cycle of hate? You got it, you got it, summer camp. And who better to have a summer camp than Hamas? The Hamas summer camp is reporting record turnout. And no wonder with all the fun activities they're having for the kids over there, like Islamic indoctrination, paramilitary training, and social activities. Oh, I hope they get on Facebook. They're all set to kick off. And last year, they had 100,000 campers. And they'll get wonderful life lessons this year, like learning slogans extolling jihad and, quote, death for the sake of Allah. Oh, other motives for this youth camp are obvious. Uh, the hits with the kids. I mean, solidarity with Turkey. What kid doesn't want to say that and, and get in with a flotilla? Also, all the kids are passionate about calling for the release of Hamas prisoners and, of course, expressions for the hatred of Israel and the Jewish people in general. Sounds fantastic. If you want to sign your kids up, you better hurry. And people are worried about the future of Israel and the borders. What problem? Later on in the program, I will have a follow-up for you on a story that we did last week about how the Muslim Brotherhood that, remember, the president says is fine. I wonder if this is connected at all. The Muslim Brotherhood, we told you last week, changed their name and their slogan. And what is fascinating is one of our researchers on this program found that that, that whole thing sounds exactly like the name change and the slogan and the agenda of an arm or a branch of SEIU 
at the teachers union in California. Couldn't be related. I'll show you before the end of the hour. I want, to, um, I want to start here where we started at the beginning. We have 14 episodes uh, remaining of this program on, uh, on Fox. And at the beginning, we were told that uh, what we're telling you is a bunch of lies. Now they don't say that because we have a long, long history, a record of being right. But what should you do? Well, prepare for tough times. Prepare to help others. Prepare to explain and teach the truth. I've been thinking about what I want to talk to you about for the next 14 episodes, and tonight I want to stop here, and we may, we may spend some time over the next few days on this, and it's going to seem ridiculous to you, but it's not. Another restaurant brawl, this time dozens brawling outside of McDonald's in San Jose, California. Now, you may not think this is important, but it is. The fight took place Thursday night at a parking lot outside of McDonald's. The crowd turned into a mob of more than 100 people, many of whom began screaming and yelling and throwing punches when the, fu the fight broke out. Five people were injured, at least two people were stabbed. Police are not saying that it's gang related, but they're not not saying it either because gang members were involved. The motive, they say, may have been racial tensions. Police say a warm evening just turned into an all out melee after a uh, a fun summer concert downtown. Oh, remember those warm summer evenings that turned into riots when we were a kid? <laughs> oh, good times. Apparently, words out that the police have had cutbacks and San Jose is feeling the impact. Check out this local report. Nearby businesses are frustrated because they say police ignored their calls earlier in the night when they called for help. There was a fight before the stabbing and there was a very small crowd. We notified the police department and uh, no police officer showed up for a couple hours and then the crowd just kept getting bigger and bigger. The city is facing budget problems like everyone else. So of course, what are they doing? Well, police protection, naturally, first thing you cut. Don't start with administrative cuts or garbage or recycling. No, no, no. Go immediately for police, firefighters, and teachers. America, we have to have the courage to notice the insanity and stop it in our neighborhoods. We have to have the courage to notice the changes in our society. We have to have the courage and the moral backbone. Otherwise, we lose the underpinnings of a decent society. And when and if this economy begins to collapse here and worldwide, America will collapse. There are signs everywhere. This morning, I was on one of the I'm going to admit to you, I do read the economiccollapseblog.com. I do. But I want to show you, it's not a happy place, but I want to show you an article uh, that I found this morning. 18 signs of the collapse of society is accelerating. There's also another 12 there, but you can read all up about it. There is an alarm bell, and that's what these stories uh, are really all about. The violence. Number four states this most recent Memorial Day weekend, cities all over America literally turned into war zones. There were reports of mass violence in Miami, New York, Chicago, Charlotte, Myrtle Beach, Nashville, and Boston, among other places. Then they point out something else that is disturbing and is happening here in New York, mob robbing. That's number 18. Quote, from coast to coast, mob robbing has become a very disturbing trend. So what is a mob robbing? Well, that's basically dozens of kids going in and storming into a, storm, uh, into a store together and grabbing whatever they want and then leaving. Recent examples of this have been caught on video in Washington, D.C., in Las Vegas, and here in New York. And have you heard about the violence in Chicago? I know this is getting some press coverage, but really? Their youth in Chicago is so out of control, tourists are now being told not to go to the Magnificent Mile, which is the city's primary shopping district. Again, they're not talking about the West Bank or sections of Beirut. We're talking about Chicago, Illinois. From the Wall Street Journal, quote, 
Police here are girding for another weekend of flash mob attacks after arresting 29 people in connection with a recent rash of assaults and robberies in and around the city's shopping and dining district. 12 crimes involving large groups of young men were reported last weekend. In addition to others earlier this spring, the attacks have received wide attention in Chicago because they have occurred around the city's affluent north side, including near the Magnificent Mile. A Michigan Avenue strip popular uh, with tourists. On Memorial Day in Chicago, there were at least six dead, at least 21 wounded in separate incidents. That would be, America, a terrible day for our troops in Afghanistan. But it's in Chicago. Last April, Chicago lawmakers begged for the National Guard. Fox reported, quote, two lawmakers who believe violence had become so rampant in Chicago that the Illinois National Guard must be called up in help, to help. They made a public plea to the governor to deploy troops. The reason why I bring this up is because this is part of the preparation. We have, we have just assumed that our children will be like us, but they don't have the foundation that we had. It's imperative that now, as responsible citizens who are awake, that we don't just sit in front of our TVs and say, yeah, yeah, or even better, yeah, well, we're America and we'll always be America. Let me tell you something. It's imperative that you get involved. Turn the damn TV off right now if you have to. Talk with your kids and your grandkids. Teach them through example. They don't learn just through osmosis. They're not trees. It must be taught. It must be taught first to ourselves. How much have you learned on this program that you didn't even know 20, what, 27, 29 months ago? It has to be taught to you, and then we need to teach it to our families and our neighbors. Save your family, save America. Tomorrow I'm starting a, a new project on the Constitution, and you can find out all about it at glenbeck.com. It's something that um, is very exciting, I think, to help teach the founding arguments, the original arguments about the Constitution, something that we must learn. It's the ultimate way of being prepared so you can save the Republic and the Western way of life. Back in a minute. All right. Last week, I shared with you the Muslim Brotherhood had pulled an acorn and changed their name. So now, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood is legally known as the Freedom and Justice Party. I mean, it looks like the EPA symbol, so it obviously has to be good. What's weird is it shares the same sentiment of the teachers' union for 23,000 higher ed employees and professors in California. The California Faculty Association has a Peace and Justice Committee, which is weird for a teacher's union. It's supposed to be, you know, busy working uh, for, uh, what is it, to quality education and fairness and for teachers and access to higher education, if I may just translate, getting their teachers on reasonably high pensions and then bankrupting the state. But strange because they have a, a strange interest in the plight of the Palestinians here. Like with this 2009 resolution, which blatantly slams Israel, it was spearheaded by a history professor with an obvious anti-Israel bias. Uh, by the way, not even worth mentioning, really. She's an Iranian immigrant who's on the organizing committee for the U.S. campaign for academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Now, to me, it makes me wonder, why is the California Teachers Union an arm, a branch of SEIU, spending so much time on anti-Israel resolutions and also trying to uh, get cop killers out of prison. Why are they spending so much time on that instead of just education? And is there any connection to the Middle East? Is there... Ah! Ah, only 14 more days. I'm sure somebody else in the press will worry about that. of just how well this democratic revolution in Egypt is going. From Christian Today, quote, 
Etrian Christians fleeing persecution in their homeland are facing imprisonment, torture, beatings, and sexual assault in Egypt. According to the Barnabas Fund, a charity that supports persecuted Christians, hundreds of Etrian Christians have uh, now been subjected to terrible abuse after arriving in Egypt. Egypt is one of the most popular destinations for Christians escaping from uh, uh, Eritrea, Eritrea. One of the most hostile, hostile countries in the world for followers of Christianity. Now, whether than, rather than being welcomed with democratic tolerance and love, these Christians are suffering abuse at the hands of Egyptian authorities or Bedouin gangs, including rape and sexual harassment, torture, beatings, and slavery. Where's the media? Here's just some of the headlines of what democracy looks like now for Christians in Egypt. Two churches are burned, 12 die, and as many as 180 wounded. Christian-Muslim clashes kill more than a dozen people. Christian man severely beaten coming home from work. 15 Christians killed, 23 Christians killed, 70 injured after a suicide bomber attack a church. Two Coptic Christians killed during a demonstration. Six Coptic Christians and one Muslim killed following a Christmas mass. Six Coptic Christians and one Muslim security guard killed in a church shooting. This revolution doesn't seem all that democratic, free, tolerant, or peaceful to me, but I don't work for Leon Panetta or the president. But sadly, this is what democracy looks like, which is why the United States is not a democracy, nor never has been. We are a republic. It is a republic that better wake up and stand up for the Christians and the Jews in the Middle East, or it will be too late. It is imperative that you know this information and tell all of your friends. You are going to be, you know, it's, it's almost a little like um, Thomas Paine. It seems to me as we are almost back in the early American days of the revolution, when the blogs are the, um, are the pamphleteers of the American revolution where the American people are telling the truth because the mainstream media is either out and out lying, are in on it, or they are so blind that they just don't recognize the truth when it slaps them in the face. It is your responsibility as a responsible citizen to tell your friends exactly what is happening in the world. And what is happening is it's an attack on faith and freedom and the Western way of life is at stake. Things are not going to get better this fall. They are going to get worse unless, unless we can scare these people back into the caves and the, and the holes the cockroaches crawled out of. The proverbial planes have flown into the towers and we seem to be sitting at our desks pretending that it hasn't happened. Freedom is a rare gift and needs to be cherished. And only 5% of all of the people in the history of the world have actually experienced freedom. Think of that. Teach that to your children. 5% of all of mankind has had it like we do. This is a book that I came across a couple of weeks ago. I told you about it last week. We're going to invite the author to come on the show with us. The Miracle of Freedom, the seven, the seven Tipping Points That Save the World. If you're anything like me, you will be up late at night reading this one. There were seven points that the world could have gone into darkness, and instead, because of a few individuals, because people were educated or knew what was at stake, they stood. And because of that, the world tipped in favor of freedom. It really is up to us. It really is firm reliance in the protection of divine providence because these rights do not belong to us. This freedom is not for our ability to go to a movie theater or whatever. It is for his purposes. I have no idea what his purposes are, but I know he is involved. Pick this book up. The Miracle of Freedom, Seven Tipping Points That Save the World. Find out about this book and also something on the original argument. 
that I begin tomorrow. You can find out that information at glenbeck.com. <laughs> These will be the times that try men's souls. And those of us who see what is on the horizon have an incredible responsibility and quite honestly, privilege. But it is a choice. Will we sit silently as the world slips back into darkness or will we be part of those who will make up the next great awakening? It is a choice. And the record of how you choose is being written right now. The thing I find a privilege is that our founders knew that our country would at some point falter. It would be perverted and the Constitution would start to be ignored. But they also believed, if you read their writings, that Americans who were living at that time would do the right thing. They were right. We are those people, and doing the right thing means to prepare for tough times, to teach our kids about the Constitution, to reach out to our houses of worship, connect arms with one another. And one more thing, don't wait for the feds. As our founders knew, any government will fail you every time at best, but your friends, family, and your God will not. From New York, good night, America.